Assalamu alaikum. Hello and welcome to this first webinar in the Patients for Headaches and Migraine series. The date is the 23rd of September 2020. The time here is 7 p.m. in the UAE. My name is Gerard Moore. I am the webinar support manager for today. So any technical questions you can send to me in the admin only button you can find in the chat bar. I will receive any admin or queries regarding any audio or video, video technical issues. Also, if you have problems, you can press the red reconnect button at the top of your screen and that will refresh your page should you have any freezing issues. The webinar is being recorded and will be active for five days after the, the webinar has finished. This webinar is uh, supported as always by Saha and SSMC and supported by Novartis. Uh, I will now hand you over to Dr. Ahmed Shatila, the moderator and chair for today, to give the official opening. Dr. Ahmed, the floor is yours. Thank you, Gerard, for the introduction. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank everyone for attending this webinar. As I've always said, these, these webinars cannot be done without you, your participation. And uh, like I said, I appreciate all the interest and all the questions that we, we always get from these webinars. Today, I would like to present Dr. Tofi al -Sadi. He is a consultant neurologist and the chief medical officer at the American Center in Abu Dhabi. Dr. Al -Sadi, Dr. Al Saadi, he did his training in neurology and epilepsy in the US, and he's currently working, as I've mentioned, as a consultant neurologist. And today he's gonna to talk to us about headaches. So without further ado, I'd like to give the floor to Dr. Tofi to talk to us a little bit about headaches. Thank you, the floor is yours. Uh, good evening, uh, everyone. Thank you very much, Dr. Shatila, for organizing this important uh, webinars, uh, addressing some of the common disorders that we do face in our clinics. So basically, I've been given the task to speak on headaches, but mainly to focus on migraine headaches. So uh, let me start with my first slide. Generally speaking, when we know that headaches is one of the most common disorders that we do see in our neurology clinics, as a matter of fact, we know that at least 80% of the general population have experienced some type of headache at one point or the other during their lifetime. And if I take a poll now of all the attendees and ask them if they ever had headaches, I'm sure at least eight or nine out of 10 of you would say, yes, we did suffer of headaches at some point or other during our lifetime. And at least a third of the population would have headaches that would require a visit to the neurology clinics for further advice on treatment. And as I mentioned earlier, headaches, as a matter of fact, is one of the most common reasons why patients would visit the outpatient clinics, specifically the neurology clinics. When we talk about headaches, we try to subclassify headaches into one of two big categories. The first category, which we call it as a primary type headaches, which represent about 90% of the headaches that we do see in our clinics are called primary type headaches. So what do we mean by primary type headaches? These are headaches which are related to some form of a brain dysfunction or brain disorder, but if we do an MRI of the brain or we do a neurological examination, the patient is otherwise normal, meaning that the MRI of the brain is normal, their neurological examination is normal, but still these patients have bad headaches or they suffer from headaches. So 90% of the headaches that we do see in our clinics are called the primary type headaches, meaning there is nothing structurally in the brain that would account for these headaches. The most common forms of these primary type headaches that we do see in our clinics are tension type headaches. Migraine headaches is very common. Less common, we have seen as well cluster type headaches. Now, what about the other 10% of headaches that we refer to as secondary type of headaches? So when we talk about secondary types of headaches, we are talking about headaches that is related to some structural abnormalities at the level of the brain. Things, for instance, such as tumor. Tumor can cause headaches, so that's one of the common reasons for secondary type headaches. If there's an inflammation 
of the level of the meninges, which are the layers that cover the brain, so meningitis, or in the elderly when there is an inflammation of the main vessels of the brain, what we call it as giant cell arthritis. These are some of the reasons why people would have secondary type of headaches. But you have to keep in mind that secondary type headaches are the less common ones. Less than one in 10 of the uh, patients with headache would have secondary kind of their headaches, meaning there is something abnormal at the brain level that would account for their headaches. Now, if you look at the migraine per se, because as I mentioned earlier, that migraine is one of the most common prevalent disorders uh, in general in neurology, as well as for among patients with headaches. If you look at the data from the United States, where we can see at least on average, 12 to 13% of the general population would have migraines. So 12 to 13% of everybody, or all the population would have headaches. Unfortunately, it is three times more common in women as compared to men, where we see about 18 to 20% of women would have migraine headaches as compared to only six to 8% of men would have migraine attacks. The other problem with migraine headaches, aside from its severity and other aspects which we will cover later on, that it tends to hit in, uh, in during the 20s and 30s, which are, as you know, these are the most productive years of your life. So when you have bad migraines, bad headaches during your 20s or 30s, that would certainly, as we will see later on, would affect your productivity. So the headaches tend to occur in the 20s and 30s. And as I mentioned earlier, it's about three times more common in women as compared to men. Now, how does it compare in, as compared to other chronic uh, medical disease states? For instance, if you can see at this slide here, you can see very clearly that migraine is more prevalent than other chronic uh, medical disease states, such as in the case of diabetes or asthma. So migraine is more prevalent as compared to uh, diabetes or asthma. Now, the big question that we face all the time in our clinics, how do we make the diagnosis of migraine? Is there any blood test, imaging study, CT of the brain, MRI, whatever, that can lead us to make that diagnosis? Well, I can tell you right now from the beginning, because that's a question we face all the time. There is no blood test for migraine. There is no imaging needed for patients when we suspect a diagnosis of migraine. So the diagnosis is made mainly based on history. History, history, history is the key factor that would allow us to make the diagnosis of migraine headaches. So if in the history or the physical examination, all the points would favor a diagnosis of migraine headaches or in other words, primary type headache. Remember what we said earlier about primary type headaches when we do not suspect anything abnormal at the level of the brain, then we're more likely either dealing with tension type headache or a primary type headache. Where on the other hand, if something on the history or in the physical examination is, is a bit alerting, then that would require additional tests including, for instance, imaging studies, and we have to look for the member 10% of the other type of headaches, what we call it secondary type of headaches, things such as tumor, uh, inflammation of the brain or meningitis or other things, for instance. So, so how we can make the diagnosis? As I mentioned, is the history is the key. Well, what are the things we look at in the history? Well, as you can see here in this slide, this is basically uh, targeting the general practitioners in their clinics or the primary care physicians when we, they see patients with uh, headaches, this questionnaire would allow these physicians to make an easy and accurate diagnosis of migraine. So it's based on basically three questions. Were your activities limited for more than one day over the past three months? Were you nauseated or sick to your stomach? Did light bother you? So these are the three questions that you could ask yourself or 
the primary care physician would ask their patients with headaches. And if your patients, or if you answer two of these three questions being yes, activities would act, would limit my, my uh, would be limited for more than one day during the time that I have headache, I would feel sick to my stomach, light would bother me. So if you answer two out of, out of three saying yes, then you have more than 95% chance that you do have migraine headache. So these are simple questions you can apply to yourself or the primary care physician could apply to their patients with headache and that would give us a sensitive diagnosis of migraine headaches. Despite being so simple, as you can see, we can easily make the diagnosis of migraine, but there is still a substantial number of patients with migraines are not receiving the right treatment, meaning they are still using over-the-counter medications. And as you will see later on, taking these over-the-counter medications, especially on long term, may result in unwanted side effects, either because of the side effects of these medications, especially if you end up taking it very regularly, or you may end up in another category called medication overuse headaches. So meaning you have headaches because of the overconsumption of these uh, uh, narcotics or these painkiller medications. Now, the big question, which I'm sure all of you would, would ask, why should we make an accurate diagnosis of migraine well well because we know that from literature from the studies that we have so far that migraine is quite prevalent and if again the data in the united states for instance we have more than 30 million people in the united states would have migraine we do not have that uh, data available to us in our region but we know it's also quite prevalent in our gulf region and it's estimated that at least one out of four in household would have migraines. So take any family with four, at least one of them would have migraines. Another issue with migraines, it is a costly disease. Caring for a patient with migraine would definitely yield an annual cost of close to about 17 billion US dollars annually. And the reason for this higher cost because of indirect cost, meaning that you, because of the attacks, there is a loss of productivity. Patients will not be able to attain to their uh, to, to their work. That would definitely affect the productivity, cost of the medication, abstinence from work, etc. And then more about 80% of patients with migraine would have some form of headache-related disability. And it's estimated that at least a third of women and at least 20% of male migraineurs, I meaning patients with migraine, would miss at least six or more days in a, in a year because of the severity of the attack. Indeed, if you look at the WHO statement, it clearly stated that migraine, along with quadriplegia, which is weakness of all extremities, psychosis, and dementia, as one of the most disabling chronic conditions. It is one of the most chronic debilitating condition. The reason being because we know that at least 50% of patients with migraine would have severe impairment because of the headaches, meaning they require bed rest, they cannot function due to the severity of these migraine attacks. If you look at the recent data looking at the global burden of the disease, this is looking at how the overall disease state would affect the general population. And you can see that migraine comes next so as the, in terms of affecting the burden of the disease. But if you look at people in their productive years, people from the age of 15 to 49, we see that actually migraine take the lead. It is the leading cause of years lived with disability. So it is a quite disabling condition. Again, for those in the productive years, it takes the lead. It is number one in terms of years lived with disability. Well, the reason is very simple. We know these patients would have bad attacks, severe attacks, and as you can see from the slide of this whole pie, at least 25% of patients with headaches would have four or more headaches per month. That certainly would affect the way they could function because of the severity of these attacks. Now, how does the migraine occur? In some subset of patients, the migraine would take this continuum, meaning they may have an aura which is a feeling that precedes the headaches. 
in some patients they may have what we call the prodromal symptoms so some feelings that usually happen a day or two before the migraine start that would alert them that they will have a migraine attack then they will have the migraine phase and we there is something called postromal phase meaning the the time after the headache phase itself but doesn't happen in that sequence in everybody by the way some patients may have aura in about 20 percent of the time but the majority about 80 percent would not have an aura before their migraine attacks so what are these prodromal symptoms as i mentioned at least some set of some subset of patients with migraine would have some features that would alert them they will have something or the headache would, ac would account to occur uh, later on. And they will have what we call a premonitory phenomena or some symptoms before their migraine attacks. And at least 25% of ba patients with migraine would feel a bit irritable, depressed, hungry, thirsty, or drowsy a day or two before their migraine. And they will tell you that I can tell you that when I will have the attack coming in a day or two, because they will feel quite different. They feel either irritable, nervous depressed or they may feel hungry to food that's why we can see that these symptoms can either take an excitatory phase or maybe inhibitory meaning they feel down depressed or on the other hand they feel irritable quite irritable or nervous right before the attack uh, would start on the other hand as i mentioned earlier that about 20 percent of patients may have an aura meaning a feeling that precedes the attack itself, which is usually some symptoms these patients would have that last anywhere between 20 to about 60 minutes before the migraine attack would start. And most of these aura consists of visual auras, where they have these scintillating lights or some obscuration in their vision, or sometimes they may have tingling or numbness in one part of the body right before the headache would start. And then they go into the headache phase itself. And typically what we see with patients with migraine attack, the headache would be of moderate severity, meaning they were not moderate to severe in severity, meaning it would interfere of their ability to carry on with their duties due obviously to the severity of the attack. Unlike other type of primary headache, for instance, tension type headache, patient with tension type headache, they will tell you they can carry on with their duties without any problem. Patient with migraine, they cannot function because of the attack. So usually it's moderate to severe in severity, can be unilateral, but in at least a third of the patients can be generalized. But more importantly, as I said, it restricts your function. There are always associated features, nausea, vomiting, photophobia, meaning they fear light and noise. And then it goes away if you go to sleep. If you go to sleep, it tends to go away, unless obviously you take treatment for it. And what happened? after the headache so what do these patients feel after the headache phase with so this is what we call the uh, the post headache phase they may again have some mood changes feeling either depressed or irritable they feel fatigued tired in about half of the time or physical tiredness or they may have loss of appetite uh, as a result of that acute attack now the big question we face all the time what could trigger the migraine attacks? Well, we know that migraine can be a genetic disorder, meaning it runs in families and about subset of patients. And the other reasons for migraines is generally unknown. But now the big question, what could trigger the migraine attack itself? As you can see from this slide here, the biggest, the bigger trigger or the biggest trigger for migraines, as you would expect, is stress. Stress is the main reason for triggering migraine attack. There are other reasons why patients may have attacks and like for instance a change in weather fasting especially during the month of ramadan we see increasing number of breakthrough migraines uh, food certain uh, food items sm smelling certain items perfume etc and in women menstrual cycle as and most of women with migraine they will tell you that their headaches tend to worsen either a few days before or a few days at the beginning of their menstrual cycle. So there are subset here of triggers that can be quite different from one patient to the other. So you have to look at your, what triggers your migraines and do your very best to avoid them. If it is, for instance, change in sleep-awake cycle, 
then you need to maintain regular hours of sleep. If it is because of excessive use of computers, iPhones, unfortunately these days, especially after the COVID-19, we became so addicted to our computers and uh, online sessions, etc. So you need to minimize the time you spend off in front of your computers or your iPhones or uh, in front of video games. If it's related to certain food or drink items, you need to avoid, obviously avoid these items. Things, for instance, and again, it varies from one patient to the other, aged cheese, uh, uh, chocolate in some patients, uh, orange juice, but the, but the list is quite long and it can uh, vary from one patient to the other. One thing to keep in mind that if migraines is not well treated, it can go on to what we call a chronic migraine. And indeed, in 75% of patients with chronic migraine, the, the main reason for this is when patients have episodic, meaning frequent migraine, that is not well treated. And that's actually a call that when patients have episodic migraine, they need to be treated very well. Otherwise, these patients will be at risk to go into chronic migraine phase. So what are the risk factors that would allow these patients to go into the chronic phase? There are several factors, but the biggest one is the attack frequency. And we'll see a slide about this. So the more frequent your attacks, the more likely you can go on to this progressive or chronic phase of migraine. If you consume too much of narcotics or painkillers, the longer you have migraine, the more likely you can go into this uh, chronic phase. There's some data suggests that obesity, increasing weight can be a risk factor. If you have obstructive sleep apnea, you snore at night time can also be one of the risk factor to go into progressive phase as well as stress, which is tends to be one of the uh, risk factor to go into the progressive phase of the disease. This is the data I was referring to you before that the more frequent attacks you have, the more likely you go on to chronic phase. For instance, if you see in this data that patients who have more than 10 attacks per, per month, these patients are at least 20 times more likely to go into chronic phase of the disease. So more attacks you have, the more likely you can go on to the chronic or the progressive nature of the disease. Despite, again, migraine being quite prevalent, and you know, uh, it certainly had a negative impact on the society in general, being quite, quite costly in many aspects. And as you can see, excuse me, from this slide, 40% <clears throat> of the population with migraine would have been candidate to receive treatment for their migraines, but only 13% of them are receiving migraine preventive treatment. <clears throat> Other thing to keep in mind that migraine oftentimes coincide with other or comorbid with other disease states, cardiovascular disorders, hypertension, uh, angina or cardiac disease is quite more common in patients with migraine. Asthma, respiratory symptoms are more common in patients with migraine. Other thing to keep in mind as well, depression, Anxiety disorders, again, is far more common in patients with migraine as compared to patients without migraine. So what does it mean? That if you have migraines, your physician have to pay more attention to the other comorbid conditions uh, in order to have the best treatment for your migraines. If you do not address these comorbid conditions, for instance, if you have comorbid anxiety, comorbid depression, and you do not offer you the right approach to treatment, then your migraines may not respond very well to treatment. So keep in mind that migraines oftentimes comorbid, meaning can coexist with other medical conditions, being cardiac, respiratory, uh, neurologic, such as seizures, for instance, or psychiatric disorders, which are very common in patients with migraines, including depression, anxiety, which uh, it's a call that all these conditions have to be well addressed, well treated in order to have the best treatment to your migraine attack. With that, I will end and I'll be very happy to take any of your questions. And again, thank you, Dr. Shatila, for organizing this important webinar. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Tulfi, for the excellent and very educational lecture on migraines. Uh, I guess before we open the floor to questions, I, I'd like to ask you a couple questions. Now, in one of your, I'm sorry. Go ahead. In one of your slides, you were talking about how only 13% of people with migraines only actively seek treatment. Why is that? Why do you think people with migraines don't see physicians? 
Well, part of it uh, bec because of misdiagnosis. Uh, as you you uh, you uh, know very well, that oftentimes patients with migraine would go to ENT physicians, thinking that their migraines is related to sinusitis, or they go yeah. to orthopedics, thinking that it is related to a disc in their cervical cord, or they go to other physicians before they come to you. Again, because of the nature of the headaches, oftentimes these patients are misdiagnosed, and that would lead, obviously, to delay until they come to see the right uh, specialist and offer the right uh, treatment and, obviously, the right diagnosis. And this is something we see pretty much all the time. So I have patients even come to me, had been uh, not only diagnosed with sinusitis, but they had surgery for sinusitis, and obviously their headache did not go away, and obviously they turn out, obviously they have migraines, and that's why the reason this, the, the surgery did not work out for them, because they, they did not have sinusitis. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree with you. I routinely see people, they come and they see me, and they say, I have sinus headaches, and I'm like, no, you have migraine headaches. You know, it's not, it's just, it's not sinusitis. They have no signs or symptoms of a sinus infection or any sinusitis, no runny nose, no post, post nasal drip, no congestion. And I think that's probably because that's why we do these lectures to educate people on the differences between these uh, headaches. So without further ado, uh, Gerard, uh, well, let's, let's start answering some questions because it looks like we're getting quite a few. Yes, hello, and thank you, Dr. Tafik, for a very good lecture. Um, we've been monitoring the chat bar both, and we've received lots of questions publicly and some on the private um, forum. So, Dr. Ahmed, uh, maybe I will start, and then you can take over uh, towards the end. Um, just bear with me. So, one of the first questions uh, we received was, um, uh, this person suffers from bad headaches. They tend to stay in bed uh, for a long time. They have tried uh, the regular uh, drugs and uh, drinking water and change, even change their diet, but continue to get them. They feel they need help. Well, what, what can you advise their first steps to be? Uh, Gerard, can you please uh, repeat the first uh, part of the question because I missed it. I just heard the last part of the question. Uh, this person, they suffer from very bad headaches routinely. They need to, they stay in bed frequently from them. They have tried regular drugs and uh, drinking lots of water and even change their diets, but they still continue to get them. Do you have any advice on what their next step should be? Well, I think the best advice I have for them that they sh should seek uh, help and see a neurologist with expertise in uh, managing patients with migraine. Uh, obviously, oftentimes that patients who have these bad headaches and not responding to treatment, that's a call that they should be starting on, a, on what we call preventive treatment, meaning they should start on drugs that prevent them from having these attacks of headaches. And there are, nowadays we have several classes of drugs that are available to us and they can act, be very effective in preventing the headaches. So these are not painkillers. These are drugs that we offer these patients to prevent the headaches from occurring in the first place. And once the headaches become reaching to that stage, that's a call that we have to intervene as early as possible. Thank you, Doctor. Mm -hmm. uh, next question from the, oh, sorry, Doctor Ahmed, do you have anything else to add? Nope, uh, Dr. Tofi uh, ex answered excellently. I can't add anything more to that. Uh, the next person uh, asks, uh, when they get the migraines, they feel um, lots of tension and tightness in their back muscles, causing great strain. Is this common that, that they feel muscle tightness and what can they do about to alleviate that pain? Again, it is very common and that's what we, has, uh, we talked about earlier on that uh, patients with migraine oftentimes misdiagnosed as being neck problem, sinusitis, etc. It has to do with the uh, uh, this, the spread of the migraine attack itself. What they have to do, they have to treat the acute attack uh, very well. Once you have good c control of the acute attack, that muscle neck spasm would go away because it's part of the headache phase itself. You treat the attack, the, the, then the, the neck spasm would, would go away. So again, they don't have neck problem. It is just because it's part of the migraine attack itself. Exactly. I can't agree more. I mean, migraine is not just a bad headache. You know, people with migraines, they're gonna complain of light sensitivity, sound sensitivity. Their whole body will hurt, literally. And I think it's not just, oh, I have headaches and I have migraines. 
No, it's it's a whole it's a whole array of symptoms that people with migraines complain of. Thank you, thank you. And I think maybe this can is a nice lead to the next question. Uh, this person's asking. Um, um, the, the, they feel their migraines are becoming worse, and it's beginning to affect their job, their employment. Um, but the, the boss does not understand. What, what what words can they use to describe to, to help them describe to their boss uh, this? I, I think they can share with them the data I just presented that migraine is one of the leading cause of disability. And in the recent uh, publication that was published in 2016, migraine, especially among those in their productive years, it takes the lead in terms of years lived with disability. So it's a quite disabling condition. And I would suggest they can show their boss that data suggesting that migraine is quite disabling and as a matter of fact it takes the lead as compared to other uh, chronic uh, neurological or non-neurological disease state. I agree uh, again what I've done actually I've had patients come to me and tell me you know my boss doesn't understand but you know sometimes it's a simple solution like you know people with migraines they may be sensitive to certain bright lights or loud noises or even certain smells so, you know, it may be something in their work, you know, I usually ask, is there anything in your job that's causing these headaches? And then I just write a medical report, you know, elaborating further that, you know, this person may be sensitive to loud sounds or bright lights, or maybe just the smell of the perfume of someone putting in their office, you know, which is, is triggering their headaches. But I think the most important thing is education. I mean, you need to educate your boss, your employer about your headaches and what they are, and that this is not just I don't want to go to work. I don't feel good. No, you can't go to work because you can't function at work. Very good. And of course, I think later in the series, we'll be having a uh, specific webinar on society's perspectives on migraine. So we'll cover that area of headaches in a lot more detail. But thank you for that question. Um, next question. It's a two-part question. Um, I rolled it into one. I had a private and a public question um, from the lady. She said that when it comes up to the menstrual cycle, they experience headaches for one or two days prior. Uh, any normal drugs don't seem to help uh, alleviate the pain. And then we had a similar uh, one on the private messaging saying that um, the birth control medication seems to cause them headaches. Do you advise changing it or, or what do you do? So, so the, the two kind of uh, questions related to uh, women's health, uh, Dr. Tafik. As I mentioned earlier that uh, in women, hormonal changes can be the reason for triggering migraine attacks. And uh, especially for women with migraine, they may have their worsening migraine either a few days before the menstrual cycle or a few days at, at the uh, after the beginning of the menstrual cycle. So provided if that their menstrual cycle is regular and they tend to have that pattern of headaches worsening around that time. There are some uh, medications that we could offer these patients that can be given prophylactically. Every cycle, we usually give them four days before the cycle and three days after the cycle, so about seven days every month, again, provided that their menstrual cycle is regular to prevent them from having these regular or a breakthrough migraine attacks during their menstruation. Now, regarding the second question, yes, birth control pills is actually one of the main triggers for uh, migraine attacks. So as a matter of fact, some patients may come to me with new onset migraines and that's, that just had started because they just started to take birth control pills. So meaning that they probably have a genetic predisposition to migraines, which had been triggered by just starting to take the birth control pills. What I would advise them to do, to go to their uh, uh, gynecologist and change their pills. There are other medications they can use, other methods of contraception they can use that has lower estrogen, which can be effective in terms of contraception, but it causes less likely to cause headaches. So I suggest they go to their physician, obstetrician, and they talk about worsening headaches. And there are many other options that have less estrogen, cause less headaches, and obviously have similar efficacy in terms of contraception. Thank you very Thank much. You. I agree so with that. I agree that estrogen, it, it's, it's a very likely culprit. It's not uncommon to see people who take birth control pills. You know, if they're taking high dose estrogen birth control pills, it can trigger migraines. And as Dr. Tofi had mentioned, 
it's possible you can either change the, the contraceptive or go with a lower contraceptive. But this is something that you should discuss with your gynecologist. There are other options, and if all else fails, there are medications that we can give and try that can help alleviate those symptoms as well. Thank you very much. Um, the next question, I believe, is from a healthcare professional. Um, they're thanking you for a great presentation, first of all. Um, and they're asking how to differentiate between sinusitis and migraine if you have nasal autonom autonomic symptoms accompanying migraine. How many attacks are needed to diagnose migraine? Is one enough? And what can be done in the primary care setting to pick up those undiagnosed patients? As I mentioned earlier, uh, sanitizer, sanitizer is one of the main ones, main uh, reasons why patients have been mistakenly called sinusitis but not migraines. But there are certain features can distinguish between the two. Obviously, autonomic uh, dysfunction uh, obviously is typically ha happen in patients with migraine or cluster type headache, but it's extremely un uh, unlikely to occur in patients with sinusitis. With sinusitis, we see the nasal discharges, uh, the positional component to their headaches, which we don't see in patients with migraines. Uh, in addition to that, just to answer your question, how many attacks you need to have before you diagnose with migraine? If you really follow the the recent classifications of International Addict Society, they recommend a minimum of five attacks that fulfill certain criteria in terms of duration, that the attack should last more than four hours, certain severity, moderate to severe, and severity associated features, as I mentioned earlier, nausea and or vomiting, photophobia and or phonophobia, then you would fulfill the criteria for migraine attacks. Early on, if you remember that I showed one slide that can be uh, can be used at the level of the uh, GP or the family medicine physician that can use based on three questions, very simple three questions. If your patient answer two of uh, answer two of these questions saying yes, to this question, then that we have more than 95% chance that we are dealing with migraine headaches. Remembering that if your activity had been restricted for more than one day, uh, once you start having headaches, uh, have you been sick to your stomach? Uh, did light bother you? If your patient answer yes to two, uh, two out of these three questions, very simple question, will take less than one minute, then your patient more than 95% of the chance that he or she has migraine headaches. Thank you very Thank much. You. And as Dr. Kofi said, you know, if you don't have if you don't have photophobia, phonophobia, nausea, or vomiting, it's extremely unlikely to be a sinus headache. You know, so with the sinus headaches, you're expecting more postnasal drip, nasal discharge, maybe congestion. But you know, you're not getting. You don't usually see the photophobia. You don't see the phonophobia. You don't see the nausea or vomiting. Uh, and I think, and also, what you don't see is you don't see the radiation of the headache. With migraines, they tend to start on one side unilateral, and then they radiate to the other side. I mean, with with uh, congestion headaches or sinus headaches, you don't tend to see those symptoms altogether. And that's, I think, what separates them from uh, nasal headaches. Thank you, gentlemen. Uh, the next question from this patient, they say they often crack their neck and end up with a severe headache, which only resolves when they sleep. It lasts for the entire night, if not two nights, is this class as a migraine? Well, again, we have to look at other features. I mean, I, I cannot say right now for sure this is migraine, but the fact if the headache is quite long in duration, it's only resolved by sleep, make me suspecting that this could be migraine. Obviously, sometimes one of the uh, triggers of migraine can be neck manipulation. And I've seen it in a number of patients that uh, some triggers at the level of the neck uh, any, for instance, uh, neck manipulation, stress at the level of the neck can trigger their migraines. But again, I cannot answer that question for sure until I have the other features. But what I can, what I have heard so far, it is suggestive that this particular patient may have migraine headache. But again, I have to have the full picture. Thank you. Uh, next question is: um, When this person usually gets headaches, they find that when they shake their head the occipital area inside shakes as though you, they've been put in a box and been shaking around like a tingling feeling. What, why is this? I can answer that if you want, Dr. Tofi. Uh, 
here's the thing with headaches and migraines is that when you get migraines, you feel like you just want to pick up your head and throw it in the trash can. So it's it's that severe. It's having migraines. I can tell you, it's it's an it's an extremely frustrating, annoying feeling. So you may feel your brain is shaking inside. You may feel the headache. Your head's going to explode from the pain. And that's the thing. Everyone's different. Some people will tell you, "I feel like my brains are rattling. I feel like my head's going to explode." But that's just one of the symptoms of why it's so severe and why it can be so debilitating. Thank you. Um, we have a couple more private questions um, to finish, unless anybody else wishes to ask any more questions. So uh, these private questions are, um, uh, this person wakes up in the middle of the night without any triggers, but migraines uh, begin in the middle of the night. Uh, what might be the cause of these nightly migraines? Actually, this is quite typical for migraines. 30% uh, of migraines would have their migraine start uh, early in the morning, around 3 or 4 a.m. in the morning. Uh, so it's not a, not atypical for migraines. In my fact, as I said, 30-40% of migraines would have their attacks starting around, 30, around 3 to 4 a.m. in the morning, and they can go on, obviously, for several hours thereafter. So this is actually one of the features we at times see in patients with migraines. So it's not atypical. Thank you, Dot. Um, we've had a, a number of questions related to protective medications or the, the new medications that are out. Many people have heard about them. Now, as we know, this is not a, um, the, the forum that we would discuss medications in a in the big sense. But Dr. Tafi, can you just give some indication of the um, of the availability of, of new medications at the minute? Well, we have. I mean, over the years, the treatment uh, of migraine, especially it comes down to preventive treatment, had evolved. Uh, quite nicely uh, and up until three years ago the only options that we had to pr to use for migraine prevention was based on oral treatment obviously these oral medication meaning by mouth medications obviously obviously these medications had their limitations being not effective all the times having side effects especially with long-term of use uh, obviously there are issues related to compliance meaning the patients complying with treatment etc but for the past two and a half years, we started to see another class of medications that they tend to be migraine specific, meaning they, they work exactly on the underlying pathophysiology of migraine. Because what happened at the, the time of the migraine attack, there's a release of some substances at the level of the brain stem. It's called CGRB, a CGRP. And what the uh, class of medication that we have available now, they target the CGRPs and prevent their release and obviously sensitizing certain brain areas and obviously preventing the migraine from occurring or from spreading. And right now, at least in UAE, we have two classes of uh, these drugs that are available to us. Uh, we have been using these medications for the past two years or so, and I believe we have collected good data and good response rate uh, on these medications. I mean, in my center, and I'm sure in other centers, have started using these medications, and we have seen very promising results with these medications. Obviously, the advantage of these medications, they are easily to administer. They're just basically, it's like a pen injection, subcutaneous injection that can be administered on a monthly basis. Uh, and the duration for treatment anywhere between 6, 12 months, and at times we can even extend up to 24 months. These medications are quite safe well tolerated with very minimal side effects and the the percentage of patients that can drop out, meaning they would not continue on treatment for these medications is quite small. And as I said, we have very good results, very promising results on the currently available uh, medication un under that class, at least what we have right now in the UAE. Thank you. Oh, Dr. Ahmed, I think we've lost your video, your, your audio. There we go. Yes. I, back to, I would say I would concur with that 100%. Thank you. And I think the, the one final question on the private uh, chat room was they, they were asking maybe not about prescription drugs, but about availability of good um, vitamins or nutrients or supplements which they can take, like that you recommend can, can help alleviate migraines. Well, this is actually one of the most common questions that we do have in the clinics. Is there any herbs, vitamins, 
that we can use to prevent or treat migraines? Well, to answer this, let me tell you this. I mean, we are now practicing an era which we, we call it evidence-based, meaning I would not recommend anything unless I have good scientific evidence to support what I claim uh, the benefit of whatever medications. What we know so far that the only drugs of that class, vitamins or herbs, that have shown consistent good results are actually Betterberg, which is not available in UAE, but it's available in the United States. Feverfew, it's also uh, have shown good efficacy results. Again, it's not available in UAE, but it is available in the United States. What is available in UAE is magnesium. Magnesium has class two evidence of its effectiveness in patients with migraines. And I do actually prescribe magnesium to my patient with migraine because it has uh, several benefits. It certainly promotes sleep, especially as you know that disturbance of sleep awake cycle is one of the reasons that patients may have worsening or trigger migraines. So I, for that, my, uh, magnesium can be quite helpful. For women, it tends to help in terms of relieving stress. So it's another good reason why to use magnesium. Plus, as I said, there is some data suggests that magnesium is good in pre migraine pre prevention. Another medication that sh have shown some good results as well, class two evidence is the B vitamin, meaning uh, mainly B2 uh, vitamin have class two evidence of it is, uh, its effectiveness in patients with migraine. But aside from the drugs that I mentioned, none of the other medications have shown any consistent or robust data to advocate their use in patients with, mig with migraine. I know that people have come to me and ask me about coenzyme Q. There's no data to support its use. They have asked about omega-3. There's no data to support its uh, use in patients with, mi with migraines. The only drugs that they have shown good results, the ones that I have mentioned early on. Two of them available in UAE, the rest are available elsewhere. And I would just uh, add to that is that one of the problems that we face with these over-the-counter natural supplements is that they're not regulated. You don't know what exactly, what dose of what medication you're getting. And, you know, there's such a thing that you could actually take something that can do more harm than good. So that's why I think that's why I think over-the-counter supplements and these medications and herbs and spices, it's really important to talk to your physician. No one should be taking them on their own and they're not always as benign as people think they are. Thank you. Thank you. And I think one final question um, in the private chat room and it was um, tell us briefly what is the difference between tension headaches and migraine headaches? And, uh, as I mentioned, yes, please. Yeah, as I mentioned earlier actually one of the most common types of primary type headaches is tension type headache. The second one is migraine headaches. The big distincting factor between the two disorders or two, two conditions that, as I mentioned earlier, that patient with tension headache, they tend to be daily headaches. They tend to be of mild, uh, occasionally moderate severity, meaning m most of patients with tension type headache, they can carry on with their duties at the time of their headaches. Whereas in the case of patients with migraine, most often they would not be able to carry on with their routines at the time of their headaches. So the severity of the attack is different. With patients with migraine, they oftentimes have other associated features, strong nausea, vomiting, photophobia. In the case of tension type headache, most often they do not have any other associated features, meaning they do not have nausea. May occasionally may have a little bit of nausea, especially if they consume too much uh, narcotics, but they don't have vomiting, they don't have photophobia, they don't have phonophobia. And again, most the most important feature to distinguish the two, that patients with tension type headache, they can carry on with their duties, whereas in patients with migraine, they will not be able to. Tension type headache tend to be generalized headache, whereas in, uh, uh, in the case of migraine headaches, can be unilateral in about two thirds. One third is bilateral, tend to be throbbing in quality, whereas in the case of tension type headache, tend to be described as tension uh, feeling, not uh, unlike the case with patients with migraine headaches. And it's not uncommon, actually, Dr. Tofi. I, I'm sure you probably see this as well as me. People with headaches tend to come with more than one type of headache. So it's not uncommon at all to have tension headaches and migraine headaches. And we routinely see people, like I see it, people come in with migraine headaches with analgesic overuse or from chronic daily use of Panadol. 
who and we always think people think oh panadol is so benign but it actually is one of the main causes of headaches i see in my clinic and you don't need a lot that's the thing you only need like six pills a week for continuous at least two months period of time to get chronic daily headaches and i think that's important to let people know about that don't you agree yeah, I agree. And as I mentioned earlier, this is the reason why migraine should be treated early. Otherwise, these patients would be at, at a high risk to, to convert into what we call medication overuse headaches. Because it's easy to get into this habit that every time you have headaches, you can take a bit of Panadol being, assuming that Panadol is quite safe, it's not safe. And as I mentioned, it doesn't take much before you can convert into medication overuse headache because of the overconsumption of over-the-counter medication being uh, Panadol, Brufen or any other of over-the-counter medication. Exactly. Looks like there's a question. And is early morning headache with projectile vomiting could be a pituitary tumor symptom? Uh, yes, please. Go ahead, go ahead. I would, I would say if you have headaches, it's important to see a neurologist. If you suspect you have a pituitary tumor, you should also see a neurologist or a neurosurgeon, this isn't really the venue to, to diagnose these type of issues. It is important to see a physician if you suspect you have such symptoms. Okay. And then treatment for tension headaches, please. Well, it, it, again, it depends on the underlying cause. I mean, there are many reasons people may have tension type headaches. As I mentioned, stress, comorbid depression, etc. So we need to look at what is the triggering or the underlying condition that trigger the the or cause the tension type headache, and then the treatment can be individualized based on uh, the patient's characteristics. But there are certainly some treatments can be offered to these patients and can bring some very good results. Thank you. Uh, looks like we got a question because I talked about Panadol. I can answer that. <laughs> What are the alternatives to Panadol? You have to stop it. That is really what the thing is. You have to stop the Panadol. Your headaches will not get better while you're taking Panadol. You need to see a neurologist because what will happen is then we'll come up with a schedule of, a, of, of medications that you need to take in order to help you go from what we call a chronic daily headache to what your headaches are really like. And we have treatments for these. And as Dr. Tofi had said, there are a lot of treatments available for migraine headaches. We have some newer treatments available as well. Very helpful. But I think it's extremely important to see a neurologist for these symptoms, especially with chronic daily headache from over-the-counter Panadol. Thank you, Dr. Mm -hmm. Ahmed and Dr. Taufik. Before I hand back to you for your final closing mm -hmm. comment, I'd like to thank all the audience that attended. We had a maximum attendance of 180. Um, so thank you all for joining us wherever you are from. This was the first in a six part series on headaches. So we'll be running them every week for the next five weeks. The next webinar will be on positive lifestyles affecting headaches and that will be with Dr. Mustafa Shara on October 28th at 7 p.m. So please mark your diaries. You are already pre-registered for it as you've signed up for this one. So we look forward to welcoming you then. If you've missed any sections of this webinar, you can go back in the next five days and re-watch it. The link will be sent to you tonight after the webinar has been completed. I will pass back now uh, for the end of this wonderful webinar for closing comments from Dr. Taufik and uh, Dr. Ahmed, please. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank Dr. Taufik for the very educational lecture and for the, the Q&A session. Obviously, there was a lot of interest and thank you for helping us answer and shedding some light today on migraines and those who suffer from it. Uh, again, I would like to thank SSMC for hosting it at this event. I would like to thank our sponsors, Novartis, for sponsoring it, and, uh, and Gerard from Focus Golf for organizing this event. So I think at the end of the day, if you suffer from headaches, I think it's important to see a neurologist. We do have treatments available. We do have ways that can make your life more tolerable. And I think you should see someone. I mean, trying to self-medicate or treat yourself at home usually doesn't work well. And that usually ends bad for the patients or the people who suffer from any symptom. So see a neurologist. That's what I would tell you. Any questions, Dr. Tofi?
No, thank you very much for organizing this uh, webinar. It's quite uh, helpful, uh, quite educational. Uh, thank you for hosting me this evening and uh, look Pleasure. forward to participating in the future ones. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you. you. And good thank night. Thank you, everyone, and good night. I'll be ending the webinar now. Good night. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.